For those of you who are not familiar with me, I'm Don Crafton, the interim director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. Some of you may have seen in the Wall Street Journal today the provocative headline, Has Europe Lost Its Mojo? And the speaker who was being interviewed uh, answered that question in the affirmative, uh, but uh, I'm not sure how impartial he was because he's the director of Harvard's new Asian initiative, so <laughs> he may, may well have an ax to grind. But today we're fortunate and we actually do have someone here who, without a shred of bias, can authoritatively answer that question. Has Europe lost its mojo for us? Um, born in Dublin, raised in Limerick, um, Mr. Pat Cox began his career as a lecturer in economics at the Institute of Public Administration in Dublin and the University of Limerick. After a stint in broadcasting, he began a long and varied political career, starting with his election to the European Parliament in 1989 for Munster as a progressive Democrat. A few years later, he was elected to Ireland's own lower house for Cork South Central. In 1994, he left this party, contested his European parliamentary seat as an independent, and won again. Four years later, he was elected president of the European Liberal Democrat and Reform Party. At the beginning of his second term, he resigned in 2002 to assume presidency of the European Parliament. Throughout his career, Mr. Cox has been a tireless advocate of European unification and enlargement. For this, he was awarded the Charmagne Prize in 2004, a prize given to the uh, first given to the founder of the Pan-European Pan movement, which began in 1922. In the words of the award committee, Mr. Cox received his award as recognition of the pioneering role played by the European Parliament in a critical phase in the development of Europe and also of his outstanding personal contribution in bringing about the enlargement of the Union. In 2006, Mr. Cox was elected president of the European movement, the objective of which is to transform the relations between the European states and its citizens into a federal European Union. In the same spirit, he joined the Spinelli Group in 2010, the manifesto of which states, nationalism is an ideology of the past. Our goal is a federal and post-national Europe. And in light of the Italian elections this week, we should be curious about the prognosis for such a Europe. How can Europe get beyond the crisis or crises? Has it really lost its mojo? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Cox. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here this afternoon. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Happily, I don't speak American, so I'm not sure what mojo exactly is. Uh, I'll cop out on that one. George Bernard Shaw remarked many years ago, although he was an Irish writer, speaking about the British and the Americans that were divided by a common language. And uh, that's actually pretty true oftentimes. Um, in general, I would say that any organ of the media, and I might underline organ if I was writing this, uh, that is owned by Mr. Rupert Murdoch is uh, an organ from which I would not expect benedictions on the European process, uh, no matter what it is, whether it is uh, broadcast or print. And for that reason, uh, I would, uh, if I was a medical doctor, not necessarily follow its European prognosis. Um, I have the opportunity this afternoon to speak to you, and I risk when I'm not uh, constrained, as I haven't been for many years now, by the speaking times in the European Parliament to go on a bit. I'd like to speak for 35 or 40 minutes and then do a question and answer session with you, if I may. And uh, I'm going to get a little signal from the audience if I risk to, to, uh, to run over. In terms of topics, what I thought I would do, because any given audience such as this, I don't, I don't know you, you don't know me, uh, how to pitch it, because we, we, we have uh, people here who are faculty, people who are senior students, people who are into the subject, people who may have a peripheral interest in it, undergraduates and so on. So I'm going to give you a quick headline of what I'm going to do. Um, it won't uh, be able to boast in academic terms of rigour, so I'm not giving you reading lists and footnotes and all the likes, 
but I hope also it won't boast of mortis. So somewhere between those two, uh, I hope, I hope uh, it works uh, for all of us. Uh, a quick roadmap. I want to talk in the first part of my remarks about the European Integration Project, a little bit about its points of origin, its heartbeat, if I might call it that, and its development, which has been, notwithstanding all these issues and crises of the moment, quite a dynamic development and worth reflecting on. The second element I want to do is to get into the multiple crises that associate largely with the Eurozone crisis, starting with the early part where I think uh, we had the wrong debate and the wrong diagnosis, and then maturing into a middle part, and we're somewhere near the end of the beginning on all of that, and hopefully therefore somewhere close to the beginning of the end in terms of looking at structures, but still a lot of complexity. Uh, your introduction described some of the things I've had the privilege to be associated uh, with. Uh, I myself, notwithstanding the, the declaratory and declamatory statements of many organisations that I've had the privilege to belong to, uh, have a fairly grounded view about what are the options open. Um, I'm certainly not a Eurosceptic and I don't regard myself uh, as some kind of wide-eyed federalist, but we have to strike the right kind of balances uh, in between. So first part then, the origins of the post-war European integration. After the Second World War, Europe, East and West, was a continent in a state of deep uh, uh, crisis, uh, extraordinary physical destruction after the war, uh, a legacy of a kind of moral nihilism uh, that had stalked the land, and a place badly in need of renewal. And the United States, of course, as a key contributor to winning the war in Europe uh, and indeed elsewhere uh, during that period, brought to Europe some of the preconditions for its own post-war integration. The Marshall Plan, without any doubt, which reflated a shattered Europe, uh, was an absolute uh, precondition for success. The Soviets were offered, or at least in their zone, in the Soviet bloc, were offered Marshall Fund aid and rejected it. And in fact, you might date in some respects the emergence of the Cold War from Soviet outright rejection of Marshall aid for states like Poland, Hungary, even for, for East Berlin. The blockade started around that time. The second big thing of the time that was a precondition was the establishment of uh, NATO in 1949. And so what we had in Europe was Pax Americana uh, with the Cold War and with all that went with that division. Others can bring you or help to bring you to peace, but only the self in any community can find that deeper thing which is reconciliation. And it fell to Europeans to find the reconciliation as others contributed to the foundations for its peace. If I might pick a small analogy, but I won't digress into it today, peace has come with negotiation and slowly and with great difficulty, but now with some new institutions, to Northern Ireland. But reconciliation remains a tougher nut to crack, and the work needs still to go on on that. And I make the point simply to reinforce what I say, that peace is a, was essential, but the reconciliation needed to be European. Most European analysts trace, uh, not to one moment of one individual, but in terms of a trigger moment that profiles this uh, stress on reconciliation, pick a speech delivered on the 9th of May in 1950 by the French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman. And Schuman conceived of a kind of a new post-war European order, talked about perhaps pooling some of the resources that themselves in an earlier decade had produced the weapons of war, talked about new ways of doing things together uh, as Europeans, specifically in the Cold War context, as Western Europeans, and uh, talked about this in a context which would build new institutions to develop uh, and to animate this new kind of reconciliation. He talked, I'd say, the heartbeat of that speech for me 
wasn't those institutions, but they were really important. I will come back to them. It was his idea, as he talked about, of la réconciliation créatrice, creative reconciliation. And the key agents of that were France and Germany, with all of the history that they had shared uh, belligerently for a century before, and multiple occupations, especially of Alsace-Lorraine, uh, in multiple Prussian or German invasions from the 1870s onwards. Uh, it included Italy, uh, so three large states, France, Italy, uh, Germany, and it included three of the smaller states, Benelux, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. And they picked two resources, coal and steel. And in the Ruhr Valley, in the rearmament by Hitler in the 1930s, coal and steel fashioned the weapons of war. And so it was no accident that they picked these two to fashion the instruments of the new reconciliation. And they agreed and established in 1951 the European Coal and Steel Community with a high authority that was the precursor of a European Commission at a later date with a Council of Ministers that was the precursor of the Council that still holds today in European institutions, and with an appointed but not directly elected Parliamentary Assembly. And so the early elements of the uh, institutional building were found uh, in that process. This matured over the years. In 1957, there were two new treaties, one Euratom, the atomic, uh, civil use of atomic energy, and the Treaty of Rome to establish a customs union among the six, uh, which uh, deepened the level of integration and which set Europe for a period on a dramatic post-war uh, growth uh, path. Indeed, in France, they talk today with nostalgia for those early decades after the war as les trente glorieuses, the glorious 30 years. Uh, and so there was a stretch where this was a, a very dynamic and attractive thing. Stood on the outside were other European states looking in. Uh, one of the larger ones looking in was the United Kingdom, uh, one of the states that clearly had contributed to winning the war, but in terms of the eventual disintegration of its empire, lost the peace. And the United Kingdom looked with, with some envy at the dynamics of this new European experiment. The UK had been invited to Messina, Italy in 1955 when the Treaty of Rome was then being formulated, and their senior diplomat, I don't want to go to notes and so on, uh, had a quote at the end, which is in a Foreign Office note, to the effect that this thing would probably never work anyway, and if they started, it probably won't uh, survive, so we shouldn't lose any sleep over it. By 1961, the British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan applied to join the European Economic Community. At that time in France, one of the post-war legendary figures uh, was in uh, office as president. That was Le General de Gaulle. And de Gaulle, in January of 1963, said non. And le non of the General put a stop to the British uh, march at that time. I might add, as a, an Irish person, that Ireland was so interlinked with the United Kingdom at this stage in a post-colonial economic relationship, even though it was politically independent, that Ireland was, in effect, one could describe it with some economic accuracy, as the poorest region of the British regional economy. And it was highly dependent on a UK uh, right across the policy range. And uh, Ireland followed as Britain. So when Britain applied, Ireland applied. When Britain got the non, Ireland, uh, ipso facto, uh, was hit by it also. Britain reapplied in 1967 under Harold Macmillan, under Harold Wilson, excuse me, the Labour Prime Minister, uh, after the Stirling crisis, again, where Britain was looking for a, a lift. And eventually, the first enlargement of this original six happened in 1973, when Britain, Ireland and Denmark joined. There were some new policies then came after that, with an emphasis on regional development and social policy. And so the first click on my... Uh, on my radar screen about how this has developed, typically it has enlarged and deepened step by step. So where you find enlargement, you can expect to find deepening, broadly speaking, sometimes the deepening preceding, sometimes simultaneously with, sometimes following, but always connected with the enlargement exercise. 
The next enlargement which breaks that rule because it was just a single enlargement was the enlargement to Greece in 1981. Uh, Greece joined at that stage uh, some years after the colonels who had led a military coup departed the scene and democracy returned to Greece. And it was seen by many largely as politically driven to sustain a new democracy and to lock it into the family of European democracies and to recognise and celebrate a European heritage coming from ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and so on. The Iberian enlargement happened in 1986, with Spain and Portugal joining, again underpinning the thirst for sustainable democracy. Uh, Spain post-Franco, Portugal post-Salazar, both post-dictatorship, connecting to the European energy. Europe, however, through this period, after the Yom Kippur War in I think it was 73, and the departure and collapse of the Shah in Iran in 79, so the multiple oil crises of that decade, left a lot of economies laid low in terms of balance of payments, higher oil prices, inflation, uh, high unemployment, and Europe had this. It was known as a period of eurosclerosis, high inflation and high unemployment. And when Jacques Delors was nominated to be the president of the European Commission, he came with a project. And the project was to reinvigorate the European Customs Union of the EEC by establishing a, a deeper, wider, more meaningful European single market. And this revived an older discussion around since the late 60s, should the single market have a single currency, and hence another kind of dynamic. I got elected in 1989. And I'm a footnote in this story, but I just observed I arrived at a really neat time, a very interesting time, because a few months later, in November of 1989, the Berlin Wall collapsed. And with it, it set off a series of triggers to do with continental European politics, some of whose after effects are still, and aftershocks are still being dealt with. But the interesting thing about all of that was here was the EEC, the European community getting on with its own development issues. And suddenly, kind of from off-centre stage, this tsunami of history rolls in on top of it. And so there was a second debate opened. One was a debate on single currency for single market. And the second debate was about so-called political union. The need to recognise a new politics that arrived on the continent that the post-communist uh, former Soviet bloc, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and so on, the Baltic states, uh, had a new dispensation. And so the history not of the consciousness of the Western European integration project. And it needed to be responded to as a political, and I dare say even uh, in some sense as a moral imperative. And then you had the eventual implosion of the Soviet Union itself. You had the re reunification of Germany. So a lot of events happened very fast. And so Europe in 1992 had a watershed deepening treaty, uh, the Treaty on European Union, hence the term European Union from that treaty, which developed the foundations for economic and monetary union, which developed light-touch intergovernmental foundations for foreign policy, for security and defence, and for justice and home affairs issues, including asylum and immigration policy. And so this was a pretty big ticket item in terms of the deepening agenda. And it came to something which was interesting. I mean, things get distilled out in politics, which are a bit of a caricature, but they're there because they're also telling something real. Uh, for example, about NATO, uh, the popular journalism of the time said it was to keep the Americans in, the Germans down, and the Russians out. Uh, and OK, it's a very telegrammatic form, but in it was some kind of truth. Around the Maastricht Treaty, the issue was whether you would end up in this new period with a Europeanized Germany or a Germanized Europe. How interesting in the context of what has subsequently happened. And even this very hypothesis itself of which kind of Europe is back front and centre to some extent. So enlarging and deepening. The enlargements continued. It grew from 12 to 15 states with the arrival in 1994 of the Scandinavians, Finland uh, and Sweden, and also of Austria. 
And then the big enlargement happened in 2004 with 10 new states arriving, two of them Mediterranean islands, Cyprus and Malta, three of them the small Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, and the rest of them from the uh, post-communist bloc, Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Slovenia. I think I've got 10 in that, but anyway, we're in the zone if I haven't named all 10. And now the EU suddenly was a union of 500 million people. It was a union with a very rich and deep internal market, a union whose share of global GDP and share of global trade, broadly speaking, give or take the year you're examining, is equivalent to a bit above or a bit below the United States of America, depending on the year of measurement. So uh, a big ticket space in terms of what had happened. What it created was something which was quite unique. A series of sovereign states who conferred authority and competence on the European Union to act in certain areas under binding international law. It provided for the making of supranational law by the Council of Ministers and the European Parliament. It provided for the supranational adjudication of disputes on EU law by a dedicated European Court of Justice. And this idea of sovereign states with different degrees of antiquity and certainly within them nations of some very deep levels of antiquity pooling degrees of sovereignty in this supranational way has no easy parallel. It is sui generis, very unique. What I would say to you in trying to summarise it before I move on to the crisis part, because I think it brings it together a bit, I should add for completion that the Maastricht Treaty had leftovers, things they couldn't agree, and it took us a long time to deal with the leftovers, two treaties in fact, a Treaty of Amsterdam in 1997 and a Treaty of Nice, so-called because they were agreed politically in those cities, in year 2000. We went on to uh, develop a thing called the Convention on the Future of Europe. All the national parliaments were present. The European Parliament was present. The European Commission was present. Representatives of each member state government were present. The chairman was the former French president, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing. They met in the European Parliament. Uh, it was a very interesting process. They basically took all those metres of treaties which I'd mentioned and they engaged in an act of consolidation of those. But at the very end, Giscard had been keeping in his top drawer a constitutional ambition and wrapped around this act of consolidation the notion that what this was was a constitutional treaty. And indeed, there were some institutional changes, and in that sense, they're constitutional, but they probably deserved a small C. But when you put a capital C, uh, Giscard was not one of the père fondateur. He wasn't one of the founding fathers uh, and as I've remarked earlier today with a class, with due apologies to the ladies, but founding mothers haven't been listed in this process. Uh, Giscard, I think, thought if he wasn't le père de l'Europe at the age he was in the convention, he might be le grand père de l'Europe, and as such came up with this bow of constitutionalism. This, I think, fatally flawed the selling of what was a significant act of consolidation but a modest act of constitutionalisation, and it was uh, holed below the waterline by a Dutch and French referendum torpedo, and that morphed into what became known as the Lisbon Treaty, and that became law in 2009. And that brings me nicely to conclude that part and move on. The conclusion, for those of you who would be used in analytical terms, to assessing the effectiveness of the instruments and capacity of international public policy through a mature federation, such as the United States of America, you always risk to be seriously disappointed with European outcomes. It is not a mature federation. It is federal in parts, pre-federal in many parts, and non-Europe in the sense of non-federal in very many parts. And this, all these moving parts, of course, complicate the story. However, I would then flick that coin and ask you to look at another face. If you looked at intergovernmental organisations, the OECD, uh, the IMF, 
the United Nations. The European Union does radically more than purely intergovernmental organisations in the making of law, in agreeing budgets, in supranational jurisdiction, in supranational jurisprudence and so on. So it is radically more than being merely intergovernmental and radically less than being classically federal. And therein lies a conundrum for the analyst and for the practitioner because Europe exists in a state EU of permanent in-betweenness, neither one nor the other. And the in-betweenness risks to compound the multiple reasons why one could be confused anyway for other perfectly legitimate reasons, but I think it's an important observation to make to you. Second thing then, to move from that into a narrower ground, but against that state of in-betweenness, to the, the crisis. When this Eurozone crisis started to emerge, people didn't talk about a Eurozone crisis. Uh, its immediate antecedents were the subprime crisis in the United States in 2007, the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008, and the beginning of an exposure of fundamental weaknesses in European banking and finance that had been hidden for so long as there was free and easy international credit on wholesale money markets, whether from the US or elsewhere, and where there was a high level of mutual self-confidence. But especially after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, to do with confidence, there was a big global sucking sound as the confidence drained out. And the consequence of this was that the wholesale money markets dried up and Europe moved into a serious credit crunch because what had happened in many places, not everywhere, is that the banks had been lending, had grown enormous balance sheets, but hadn't grown their deposits pro rata because they were filling the gap by the easy access to relatively low cost tsunamis of global finance. But when the tap was turned off in the global finance, suddenly there's a crunch. The faucet is off, now there's a crunch, and now you've got uh, some of those hard realities. That's a background. But the immediate trigger came from another, another context. Uh, George Papandreou was elected, uh, PASOK, the Greek uh, Social Democrat Party, elected to government in 2009. And he did a thing that's not unusual for people after they're elected. He said, we're going to look at the books, because we think the other boys may have cooked the books, and there's a good chance at the beginning of a, any new uh, government, pretty well globally, to say you can blame the first year or 18 months on the other guys, which anyway may be true. So they look at the books through the Greek statistical office and condense what became a very difficult story. They made three revisions to the estimated size of the Greek budget deficit. And at the end of the three revisions, the final one done with Eurostat, Eurostat, the European Statistics Office, the Greek budget deficit was revised upwards from 4.5% of GDP to 14.5% of GDP. And now the crisis was on. A little step back. The Maastricht Treaty designed the Economic and Monetary Union. And when you're doing these treaties, you get in them what is the available political level of consensus. The available consensus was to have a European Central Bank, a single monetary policy, the setting of the interest rate by the bank, the repo rate would be set by the bank, and a monetary policy that would be driven by uh, control of inflation, so an inheritance from the German post-Weimar Bundesbank uh, logic, and um, a high level of independence, so, you know, free from political interference. So a kind of a federalised monetary policy. But on the economic part, the states were not willing to give up their sovereignty to make budgets. So a rule was introduced called the Stability and Growth Pact. And the Stability and Growth Pact had two legs, both rules about budget. One, that your budget deficit normally could never go above 3% and ideally was less. So that if a crisis came, you had the headroom to borrow up to 3% of GDP. So normally it's in balance, but in, on the rainy day, it could go up. Second element, that the accumulated debts of a state should not be more than 60% of GDP. Now, there's a sense if you ask me about this stuff, I mean, why 3% and 60%, why not 4% and 75 
because that's what they decided is the short answer to that. There's no specific kind of theological economic reasoning why one number was better than the other. But the purpose was to constrain a decentralised fiscal policy. That might have worked. Whether it would have worked to get over this crisis that came, who knows. But in the end it didn't work because those two rules were observed more in the breach than in the observance. They were breached more than 60 times, each of the rules. And the first biggie to breach the rule was Germany itself, even though Germany was the one who'd insisted on the rule. Uh, there were two gold medal performances, guys who never met the rule, and they respectively were Greece and Italy. So th they won every year always for never observing the rule, and some broke it occasionally, and some didn't break it at all for years until real stress came. Ireland and Spain, for example, were two of the better states uh, under these rules in terms of keeping their noses clean until the economic downturn hit and other issues then were exposed. So the Greek crisis comes against that background, and I'm using the, the language of the time, and what will Europe do about it? The Lisbon Treaty just became ratified law in December of 2009, and one of its consequences, we're not short of presidents in the European Union, I had the pleasure to be the president of one institution, the Parliament, but we now had another new president, the president of the European Council, meaning that group in the EU which is a summit meeting of the heads of state and government. They said, you know, this notion every six months of having a new chairman is goofy. We need someone permanent to massage the agenda, to get stuff done between meetings, to sort stuff out properly. And so the first one up is a former Belgian prime minister, currently still serving, Herman van Rompuy. Herman van Rompuy goes to the toolkit, because he's instructed, you know, sort out this Greek thing. He goes to a toolbox, he looks inside, he sees no tools. So the first big crisis is that the guy has no tools. One tool that you might use is a bailout fund. Someone's in trouble, you go to a fund, you reach in, you give them some money with conditions, and you say, that'll tide you over, you know, do your homework, sort out your problems, follow these conditions, and there's the money. But Europe had a no bailout rule in the rules. So the handcuff goes on one arm. The second possibility is you come at it through another route. You come through your Fed, through your central bank, and you give monetary financing to the state in question. But there's a rule in the treaty, no monetary financing. So now they're doubly handcuffed, because the two things you might do, you can't do. So what they did, they produced by March of 2010 a bailout for Greece, bailout number one, they generate 110 billion euros between EU resources and IMF, and that for the moment is a fix, a quick fix, it gets them over it. Van Rompuy's summary I thought was very good. Van Rompuy said it was like constructing a lifeboat while you were still drowning in the sea. And I think that's kind of pretty accurate, because the toolkit was empty. The next stage was to develop an emergency toolkit. And I won't go into the details, I'm happy to go into it in, in, in Q&A. But the emergency toolkit consisted of the establishment of a number of funds, of which the main one was the European Financial Stability Fund, uh, and there was another one with money through the European Commission. And between these funds, they had a ceiling of up to 440 billion euro, now a kind of a temporary rainy day account, whose meter in parking terms would expire in 2013. But it was something to be getting on with. The European Central Bank, meanwhile, was busy. It, it brought down European interest rates eventually to the lowest we've ever seen them since the euro was established. The repo rate in Europe was 0.75%. For overnight bank money in Europe today, it's close to zero. Uh, they gave tsunamis of emergency liquidity assistance to European banks in trouble, uh, amounting to 150 billion euros at its peak, of which Ireland, with a severe banking crisis, accounted for about 40% of the total at peak, even though Ireland is only 1% of the GDP of the Eurozone. That's now well down from peak. It introduced new financing measures, first short term and then medium term for banks, of which the biggest one is a thing called long-term refinancing operations. These LTROs, long-term refinancing operations, in two tranches in December 2012 and in, uh, sorry, in, in December 2011, and in February of 2012, gave out nearly 1.2 trillion euros 
in medium-term credit to European banks to get over the faucet problem, the credit drying up, the confidence issue and so on. And most recently, in September of last year, Mario Draghi, who took over the central bank governance a few months earlier, gave a speech that kind of steadied a lot of nerves when he said, we will do whatever it takes to save the euro. And specifically, he introduced the thing, uh, uh, OMTs, uh, something, I, I, I'll come with the term, but it's secondary, a scheme to buy securities up to three-year uh, terms on secondary bond markets for countries like Spain or Italy, which then were the big problem, with conditionality. Uh, and so far, the interesting thing, this had the effect of bringing down bond spreads in Europe between different states and so on uh, in a very dramatic way. They haven't bought one bond. The announcement effect so far, uh, this may not hold, but so far is the thing that did the trick, that the announcement of the, un the willingness to have an unlimited intervention and to do whatever it takes if necessary. However, the Greek crisis misdescribed as such turned out to be a crisis that wasn't only in Greece. And then it became, in European parlance, the peripheral country crisis. So you had Ireland, Portugal and Greece. But that too kind of missed the point because a spillover contagion started to arrive in Spain and Italy to do with debt issues, to do with public finance, and to do with banking issues in Spain and public finance. And the consequence of all of this was that people, of course, realised that it never was only a Greek crisis, it actually was much more complex. And what it was really throwing up was the original design flaw of a centralised monetary system with a decentralised and effectively unconstrained budgetary and fiscal capacity. And so that realisation hasn't been easy. And here we come back to the in-betweenness and the handcuffs. If the rules didn't let Europe, qua Europe, do what Europe should do, who's going to do that thing? And the answer is you go back to your summit meetings and to your leaders, not to decide detail, that's a hopeless place to do that, but to give a general policy orientation. And all these people who show up there, there are 27 leaders from 27 states of 27 public opinions, 27 parliamentary majorities, 27 potential national constitutional constraints, 27 public opinions of pretty tough views about this. If we were sat in Germany and not in South Bend, Indiana, and if we were 60-somethings who couldn't retire now until we're 67 or couldn't get our old age pension until we're 67, and we live in a modest apartment and we're living somewhere in the Ruhr Valley, and we've had wage constraints for the last decade as part of the German competitive cycle, and we've modest savings, and suddenly we're looking at TV and we're seeing that guys in Greece who retired at 55 are getting a whole shipload of German money to rescue them, you kind of get worked up about this thing. And so these are real constraints. So Mrs Merkel, who's an indispensable player, because she's German, yes, but it's not Germany, it's Germany's scale, it's the biggest player in the zone, it's its credit rating, AAA. It's its ability to borrow. The bond sells at a lower price than pretty well everything else in the EU. Uh, is a, she's a powerful player, but she's powerfully constrained as well. These are other real things. She fought a series, Germany's a federal republic. She fought a series of critically important regional land elections in Germany in the last 18 months. And her party lost some of them where they'd been in governance for 50 consecutive years. So this is real time as well. And they're having an election uh, in September of this year, late September. So I would say some of the things that may solve this crisis longer term, in principle, the German elite is up for it. But they may not sign up this side of an election because ponying up the grim reality of the cost uh, is not going to win them an election. Not dealing with it up front risks to create political backlash after an election, which is the downside risk of that. But I think that's kind of where this thing is a little bit with Germany. But I think Germany does want to see longer-term solutions. So the final part of my remarks, what might they be? Well, the first longer-term solution that's being looked at is a recognition that part of the wreckage to do with all of this has been bad banks, 
so I use the phrase just in the loose, is not in a moralising or judgmental sense, banks that were just out of whack to do with balance sheets, to do with uh, liquidity, uh, to do with access to credit, uh, that need to downsize, that need to, to build up their own uh, deposit base and so on. And these, uh, these banks have had spillover consequences for sovereign states. Uh, Ireland is an extreme case, but not a unique case, where in this recession, Ireland struggled, but was managing. But when Ireland ended up putting all the bank debt on its shoulders on top of its national debt, it fell into a programme space because the markets gave up in pricing terms on Irish bonds and they priced Ireland off the market. Uh, but Ireland is not unique in that. I just give it as an example of this kind of phenomenon. So the consequence of all of this, if I add all the pieces up, is that the first stage that Europe has agreed to, that I think in all probability will be legislated for in the coming six months and that will be operational law not later than the first quarter of next year, is a banking union. And the banking union will have three parts. Key supervision of key banks will now pass to the European Central Bank and out of the exclusive hands of national regulators who are asleep at the wheel through all that period. Second thing, there will be a resolution mechanism. You have it in the United States in the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation going back to the 1930s. You've wound up about 500 banks since the 1930s. We've wound up zip mostly. A few of them have collapsed, but mostly states have intervened. And so we have a whole issue of banks grow topsy across borders, but they fail nationally. So how to deal with that? And the third issue is a kind of a Federal Deposit Guarantee Scheme. Now, whether we're going to get all those over the line, I don't know, but the plan is to do that this year. The medium-term post-German election is to look, and I'll have to wrap up here, but the post-German election is medium-term to start looking at other unions, to look at a fiscal union. The Germans, who might have to pony up more money or more reserve than others on this, but it's a real debate. How does Southern Europe get out of the doom loop it's in at the moment to do with unemployment? They've got to clean up their Fiscal Budget Act, because it's indispensable for sustainable uh, public finance in the future, but they need a lift from somewhere. And so there needs to be some kind of a fiscal capacity at the European level, uh, tighter economic governance in Europe, and there are new rules on that. Uh, and the final thing is so-called political union. All of this has created enormous political strains. And to close out, let me pick one. Uh, we got uh, yesterday the results of the weekend election in Italy. The single party that got the largest number of votes was the party of Beppe Grillo, the uh, Italian comedian, um, who, whose campaign was web-based, blog-based, who's elected 108 deputies in the Camera dei Deputati and 48 or 54 senators or whatever in the Senate. These people have never met as a group. They've never had a party congress. You don't know, you know what, what way the cookie crumbles. And just taking that, it's, it's a signal to something out there. He campaigned against Mario Monti, the guy who was the technocratic prime minister uh, who did you know, a tough job in tough circumstances. Uh, Monti ran a party in this election. Monti's party got fourth. It got the worst of all the key parties uh, running, uh, which is a statement something. Uh, I don't know. I think I would buy a clove of garlic and bring a steak to the crossroads if I met him. But Silvio Berlusconi is back as party number two. Uh, incredibly, after all that went before. And so it shows a real difficulty here. And this political union thing is complex, but the issue of how do you find legitimacy and accountability in a multi-level governance system that requires effective multi-level governance. Uh, very last comment, if that wasn't complicated enough, for a variety of uh, domestic and other reasons, Mr Cameron is threatening to throw the baby out of the pram and wants to have a referendum in the United Kingdom uh, in five years' time uh, on issues unspecified, on terms and conditions unspecified, which will open up a whole other wing in this debate. So Europe will not be short of, uh, of uh, interesting comment. The mojo question in the end, I think so much political capital has been invested in this, so much of the earlier history I've described, so much of the dynamics of coping with... Uh, post-dictatorship uh, states has been such a brilliant investment that too much has gone in to let it dissipate. There will be a high political and economic financial cost to sorting it. 
so the mojo will have bumps in the road. But I think the cost of not sorting it would be even greater, and that will be the driver in the end of ultimate success, in my view, but with lots of difficult bits in between. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your comments and questions. And uh, I think it does answer the question, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, wait and see. But those are, those are some nice tips. Let's see. Melanie, we have a, a little something here. We'd like to give you something to remember your visit to Notre Dame by in your uh, remarks here today. Thank you so much. Uh, sort of a, a diplomatic portfolio without the <laughs> diplomatic part. <laughs> Excellent. Well, there's someone without portfolio. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Now we have a little time for uh, questions and answers. Um, anything goes, please. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, I have a, a, a question. Um, I have the technical term that I make my students learn is optimal currency area, currency mm. area, right? And we're told that optimal currency areas have certain characteristics. And you nicely described how uh, Europe falls between uh, the U.S. and other types of systems in not being quite federalism but having parts of federalism. And one of the things I found sort of vaguely amusing in the journalists, it's like every journalist suddenly discovered that there was a theory about what optimal you know, currency unions should look like and the fact that Europe isn't actually one. And in part, this is because of the process you talked about. You expanded and you deepened, and the expanding brought in different types of countries, and particularly developing countries that maybe didn't fit the characteristics of a, a currency union. Um, and I always wondered, you know, and you were in this process, what were people's expectation? Was the expectation that this would be fixed when the crisis hit, right? And that we would move, that federalism would occur as we had a series of crises? Uh, was it just the hope that the crisis would never fit, hit and that, you know, the lack of uh, sort of federal uh, list system would not be, not, not matter? You know, because it, it was an imperfect union for a variety of political reasons that you've discussed at the initial. And what were the expectations of the people who uh, agreed to this sure. imperfect political Well, uh, I mean, it, it, it is, after the fashion, a fair way to describe it, but perfectly honest with you, the perfect union is not available. This is in paradise or some other place. We, we live in the real world. And wherever one looks, perfection is something much to be sought after, but rarely achieved. My own feeling on this, as you ask it, which is a very interesting question, I and mean, one can ask oneself the question, but I suppose I would go in answering it to, to something, I think there's an American near equivalent of this from Yogi Berra, but the guy I like to quote is Niels Bohr, a Danish physicist, who won the Nobel, Peace Prize in, uh, Nobel uh, Physics Prize in 1923 who said prediction is very difficult, especially when it's about the future. <laughs> and it seems to me that your question, how come guys didn't see it, is a fair question in the benefit of hindsight. How come guys didn't see, so let me switch jurisdictions, that the progressive deregulation of banking and investment and derivatives and so on uh, by the Fed and by the federal government in the United States would lead to the crock that ended up in Wall Street in 2007, 2008? The answer is because the presumption as the journey started was it was bringing you to a different destination, closer to something available. You're right, a lot of people have taken out old copies, dog-eared copies of Robert Mundell and optimum currency theory. But in fact, Robert Mundell, after the establishment of the euro, uh, wrote more favorably than some of the people who've gone back to his origins about it. But I would say to you, Overall, the, the necessity from the crisis uh, to the extent that people uh, wish to continue to invest political and economic capital in this is not necessarily as a first response to abandon what you've committed to, but to seek, if you haven't done it the first time, to perfect it and to understand what were the engineering elements that were the missing ingredient. So, for example, because I haven't really gone into that thing, 
Uh, a lot has happened on the regulatory side, including two new treaties, which are international treaties, not EU treaties, because the UK and the Czech Republic wouldn't sign up to them. And they are, in the short form, a fiscal compact, so new treaty-based uh, budgetary rules, not unlike the old rule, but with real teeth, not with the old rule where the Council of Ministers can meet and engage in a policy of what I've described elsewhere as lax mutual comprehension. I won't damage you if you don't damage me when I'm up on the review. Uh, they've switched the voting system on council to the need to whack you and to take you on and put in conditionality about how you run your affairs unless a majority is mobilised not to do it. So it's a reverse qualified majority. So the rule is that you, 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 you suffer the consequence of breaching the rules now unless you can mobilise a majority of the country. The old rules were the exact opposite. The penalty is only hit if a majority mobilised to hit. And of course people, assuming it might be my turn someday, look the other way. No one anticipated, I think, the depth and extent of the crisis and specifically then to do with one of the design issues why I think uh, several moving parts are required. Southern Europe in particular is suffering a very severe crisis. Greece is in its sixth year of depression. Italy is in its third year, uh, uh, less severe than Greece, but uh, quite severe. Uh, Spain, uh, likewise. Um, the levels of unemployment in these states is uh, appalling. Uh, the level of youth unemployment is scary. And this is a social condition that has to be addressed by some reflating capacity. Now, one of the things right now, and I'm just to, to, again, I take a little digression, the EU budget is really small. The EU budget is less than 1% of the GDP of the 27 states. The US budget, federal budget, is something north of 20% of the GDP of what is the richest economy in the world. So these are two very different capacities to act. We're not going to have a 20% of GDP budget anytime soon, but we need something more ambitious than a 1% of GDP. And just two weeks ago, the heads of state and government for the next uh, six-year cycle actually reduced the EU budget for the coming six years compared to the previous six years, which is some kind of strategic illiteracy. My feeling is it's to do with some of these electoral cycles, and my feeling after those electoral cycles, we have to come back to deal with your questions. Uh, if these are not dealt with, the internal pressures on states to respond to the real social and economic needs of their own citizens will be compelling in a different direction. So the European Union is before a moment of some real crystallisation to do with commitment. And these papers that have emerged, and they're not yet the law, but these papers published by Van Rompuy and the other institution presidents on moving towards what they called a genuine economic and monetary union with its banking union part, its economic union part, its fiscal union part and its political union part is a serious redesign plan. Uh, the banking union part is already up and running in terms of legislative process. Uh, the others will need to happen. And the last comment out of Yesterday's Italian result, I've seen already the bond spread for Italy go up a bit. It's gone up by about, uh, I think, 35 or 36 uh, basis points. But after Monty took over, it came down by 200 basis points. So it's still not back where it used to be, and hopefully it doesn't get back there. But that's an issue we've got to wait and see what emerges in the next few weeks. But I think in the end, this was, you know, people don't sit down and designing things. They, they will take advice, but they don't sit down to uh, design the perfect. They, they sit down and end up with the available. But if the imperfections are fundamentally flawed, they catch up with you. And that's where we are at at the moment. Yes, please. Mr. Cox, first of all, thank you for the time. It's an honor to have you here at Notre Dame. My name is Andrew McDonough. I'm a senior student in political science in German. And I'm actually writing my senior thesis on the effect of the current recession on public opinion in the European Union. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for the lecture. I wanted to ask, do you think that the economic crisis has led people to base their support for the EU and European integration based solely on their personal financial well-being and not necessarily on a post-materialist desire to belong to a larger community? And then if so, how can the EU continue to drive that integration during a time of economic turmoil 
how can the EU reach out to, like you said, that 60-year-old retiree mm. in Germany um, in order to overcome that problem and continue to move forward with the integration? On the state of public opinion, um, the most comprehensive set of data you'll get is the Eurobarometer reports, precisely because they have a common kind of benchmark over time. They have shown a decline, not surprisingly, in this period of crisis in support. It still remains net positive in most places, but not everywhere. It's net negative in some places. And in the United Kingdom, it's mostly net negative, independent of all of this. And the UK isn't a member of the Eurozone. And by the way, independently of the Eurozone, has been downgraded in its uh, credit rating uh, and is undergoing a severe austerity program and so on. So the complexities of the contemporary crisis in Europe are deeper than the Eurozone alone. Uh, witness, in other words, the, the sense of uh, uh, adjustment uh, fatigue, uh, not, not just in Eurozone states. Um, let me give a small bar, if, you, if you're in public opinion. There was a, a poll commissioned in Ireland uh, published in January 2013. The polling company is a reputable company called Red C, capital C. And one of the questions asked, uh, which captures uh, a flavour of your question, the material and the rest, if Britain left the EU, how would you vote as an Irish person in a referendum, in or out? And two thirds said they would vote to stay in. Now that could change on the day of a vote. So I'm just giving it a straw in the wind. And I would say that is a kind of a rational, relatively materialist assessment. Where is the balance of the Irish interest? Um, I would say many of the states, uh, if I go to Central Eastern Europe, and you know, I've worked in all of those states uh, over many years, especially pre-enlargement, they had two big post-communist desires. Number one was to join NATO, to keep any fear of a Russian bear off their back. And number two was to join the European, economic, uh, European Union and economic uh, dimension for a, tr a transformative capacity. And uh, these are, of course, to go to my earlier remark, uh, always things that are well short of perfection. But let me give you a little example. I do a lot of work at the moment in Ukraine to do with uh, Mrs. Timoshenko and other prisoners there. And I looked at data for Ukraine, three, three statistics from the UN Development uh, Report, because I think they're revealing. Number one, when you're born, what's the infant mortality? What's your chance of surviving in your first year? Number two, after you've survived the first year, what's the longevity? How long are you likely to live on average? And number three, for all of its flaws, in purchasing power parity, what's the GDP per capita? Ukraine and Poland, broadly similar. Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. Poland was part of the Soviet bloc. Both are big states, Poland 38, 39 million, Ukraine 47 or 48 million. Ukraine independent since 1992, Poland uh, likewise, uh, a little bit earlier. The Polish infant mortality is now one third of the Ukrainian one. The Polish longevity is about eight and a half years more than Ukraine and the Polish GDP per capita and purchasing power parity is about three times Ukraine. Now, is Poland heaven? No. But that transformative capacity worked. So I think a big part of the thing is material. Where you find the more uh, non-material uh, dimension, but I'm not saying you necessarily find it when someone goes to vote, is in those debates about the reconciliation about the capacity for the dynamic of kind of bringing Europe back together after the, the collapse of communism, etc., uh, where you find the Franco-German reconciliation, uh, uh, the uh, 50 years of the Elysee Treaty was celebrated in Germany recently, where you joint meetings of the Bundestag and the French Assemblée Nationale, among other things. So, so those are there, but I think they have, in the undergrowth of all this economic crisis, I think the material the unemployment issue, and those are looming pretty large, and I think will we'll stay that way for some time, which is a, an additional urgency for Europe to start uh, fixing the plumbing where it's leaking. Yes, please. Maybe I'll take a few questions, because I see a few hands up, and I'll give shorter answers to Yeah. Okay, so I come from Ukraine, mm -hmm. and my question will be conditioned uh, by, this, by this context. As you well know, Ukraine is... Uh, 
very much divided about its European future and divided in public opinion. Also, a political establishment is not unanimous, though rhetoric could sound quite uh, strong about belonging to the European Union. Uh, because of this crisis, in U different crises in Europe, uh, Ukrainian Euro optimists are troubled and concerned that Europe, uh, European Union could, be, uh, could become inward looking and not really looking to its neighbors and uh, not giving really a, a good sign of further enlargement of European Union. Uh, while Euro Eurosceptics are glad, of <coughs> course, and now in Ukraine even a rhetoric is emerging that uh, Europe is not really a very good place and it has its own problems and Ukraine should stay away. So my question is about this inward-looking Europe. Is, it, is there, there such a risk? What would you think? Okay, let, let me take another question. Please, gentlemen here, yeah. Uh, how would you assess Prime Minister Monti's performance, especially as steward over the Italian economy? And uh, how can you explain this complete rejection of him in the context of this recent vote? Okay. Um, okay. I'll, t I'll take those two. U Ukraine, I mean, the, the issue is, you know, will Europe consume itself with introspection? I think there's no doubt that every time that... Uh, a political elite is consumed with crisis, uh, that it is a limited amount of political capital to spend, and like all capital that's scarce, if you're spending it on one thing, you're not spending it on another thing. So that, that element is everywhere where there's crisis. That said, the uh, policy with Ukraine is in a very particular year. Uh, the Eastern Partnership, uh, EU is all new neighbours, because the EU border moved east, so now all the guys who were the neighbours of the new guys are now the neighbours of the EU. So we've got this Eastern Partnership, it involves a lot of the uh, post-Soviet space that is not in EU, and Ukraine is the largest of those states. And uh, later this year in Vilnius, Lithuania, there will be a summit meeting of the Eastern Partnership. And what is on offer to Ukraine, which is not at all uh, uh, minimal, is uh, an association agreement with the European Union which is the most advanced association agreement that the Union has ever drawn up with a non-member. So short of membership, uh, this is the, the, the best deal that I've seen done so far, potentially. It would be accompanied by a deep and comprehensive free trade area agreement. It would be accompanied by a deal that, even though it must be ratified in every member state of the European Union, that pre-ratification, that those parts which are within the competence of the European Commission would already be actioned in advance, and it would be accompanied by a progressive visa liberalisation, which is a big issue, as you know, between Ukrainians and EU states. There was a summit meeting yesterday in Brussels, and one of the issues that the summit recognised was that the Verkhovna Rada, the parliament in Kiev last week, actually passed, because they hadn't been meeting since the election, they'd been blocking parliament. They met last week, finally, and they passed uh, an EU resolution uh, on this association agreement and this process of which I speak, and the only party to vote against it was the Communist Party. So the party of the regions, Batkashina, Udar, all of this, Swoboda even, uh, for all of its nationalist uh, qualities, uh, voted for it. I do accept what you say about Ukraine has a, a deep and ancient history. It means borderlands anyway in English language, and it is borderlands. It has its Russophone part and its Ukrainian part, its Russian Orthodoxy, its Unitarian Church. And this is, you know, the geology of its history runs very deep. So the, the, the issue for Ukraine and EU, because EU really is up to do the business this year, subject to some conditions that have been set long ago, not new conditions. If we can get that thing over the line, I think it's important. Why? Because this is, this is not a, a kind of a, a zero-sum game. Either you do that or, you know, you, you, you go back to where you are. There's enormous pressure from Mr. Putin in his third term as president, to leave a legacy effect for himself in the establishment of a kind of uh, greater Russia. And he has an idea to establish a customs union into which he's seeking to force Ukraine, uh, with a view to establishing through that uh, something that mirrors, but not quite, the European Union, the Eurasian Union. The problem with the Eurasian Union, it would be basically a Russian-dominated post-Soviet space 
who's in it at the moment, Uzbekistan and uh, Belarus. And so far Ukraine has, has kept a distance. So this is a big year for Ukraine and I hope it gets through. And the European part notwithstanding the crisis is very committed to this, but with conditions. And I'm on the front end of all of them, which is the, the prisoner issue. Second question on Mario Monti's performance. There's no doubt, the big measure of Mario Monti, if I was giving in a, in a sentence, uh, the fag end of the Berlusconi administration saw the contagion in Italy of the Eurozone crisis coming to a point where the crisis was too big to save the state, where the bond spreads had uh, grown enormously against the German bond, and the effect of Monti's reforms has brought the bond spreads down by 200 basis points, two full percentage points. And that's the key measure, you know, in a, in a quick kind of medical examination, taking the pulse and saying what was the outcome. Uh, this required uh, a series of reforms. Italy has long needed internal reform, euro apart, uh, and uh, hasn't, uh, hasn't delivered on those structural reforms in the labour market uh, and those kinds of things. In the end, yesterday's vote was a, a, a third and round popular rejection. Mr Berlusconi promised to hand back a property tax, which was unpopular, €4 billion, Euros, and sent letters out to every household showing the form that you would fill out with your local regional government to get the money back. And some poor foods went to the regional government with the form to get the money back, uh, thinking this was already, from Mr Berlusconi, the real deal. Uh, he ended up uh, being the second party, as I said, in the system. Beppe Grillo is completely, uh, you know, the campaign was anti-political, so anti-political party, I mean anti-establishment. He talked about Mr. Monti, uh, I talked earlier about rigor and mortis, he talked about rigor mortis up and down Italy, and the rigor mortis message clearly stuck. Mr. Monti came, limped in a poor fourth, and will not be a key player, I'd say, in... in in, he may be still in government some way if they produce some kind of grand coalition. But a lot of guys would need to coalesce in the grand coalition said in the election they would never do that. But then it's after the election, so who knows what they'll do. If it doesn't work under the Italian constitution, there is a provision that allows for new elections in 70 days. I think no one wants to contemplate that right now. And a really busy guy is Giorgio Napolitano, the president of Italy, who has to, between now and the 15th of March, try and get some operational arrangement in place for the first meeting of the Camera di Deputati in Rome. If that doesn't happen, the possibility of the Greek scenario of a second election would loom larger. Too soon to call. The problem with any new administration is how long could it survive given its diversity. And what Monti got was a free pass for several months to do things for people who didn't want it held their noses but the free pass has now expired. Yes, please. Thank you so much. It was very, very interesting, your topic. I have a question that I would like to know uh, from Spain. And I would like to know your opinion, and I am uh, a labor scholar. Uh, in my opinion, is the European Union, not only the Euro, the European Union in general, have to resolve some of the contradictions that uh, we are facing for the future, in the sense that some of the alternative programs eh, in the uh, different countries, in my country, for example, in Spain, are totally opposite with the, the, uh, the directive, the constant directive, for example, of part-time, the ILO Convention about um, um, protection and against unfair dismissal. There is a contradiction between the uh, European law and this austerity program, and the results are very unpopular because in Spain, and, uh, after the, the legal reform, the unemployment has increased a lot, mm -hmm. and the inequality has increased a lot against all the, the prevention uh, against discrimination between men and women. This means that we have to, to resolve this question. The European Union is not facing all the question in economic level. We have to resolve also the European Union have to resolve rights questions, social questions, because we have to comment also all the, the all the protests in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece, all the the, the increased level of suicides, the people who have committed suicides because they, they can't pay the mortgage. This is a tragedy. And in order to resolve the question and to to guarantee the people feel as European, I think the European Union have to resolve, to resolve internal contradiction 
this legal and national reform are against the, 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 uh, the European Union in the sense of, I mentioned one example that they don't want to extend more, part-timers, for example, a conciliation between family and work. is totally opposite. This uh, European uh, law protect eh, and guarantee equality in some way. And this national reform, uh, because the, the, the austerity problem, he's, he's fighting with this, with this mm. level. What is your opinion about this contradiction, how we can resolve, how we can apply in the national jurisdiction the case <coughs> law from the a court of justice when you have this law? Um, I, I guess you're a lawyer, but I don't know, and I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> and so I can, I can claim comprehensively not to know. Uh, I don't know Spanish labour law and its transformation of EU directives, and I'm not trying to dodge your question. I mean, I, I can plead to pretty comprehensive ignorance on the detail of the implementation of European law in Spain to, to, to do with uh, labour market. Um, I have followed Spain at a macroeconomic level, and I think it does feed into some of the surrounding conditionality. Uh, whatever the legal instruments may be, the overwhelming weight of the recession in Spain, so I come back to this point that I was at earlier about the, the north-south dimension, if states are going through a clean-up campaign to do with their own budget deficits, and by the way, the Spanish budget deficit uh, this year uh, is likely to be the largest in the European Union, notwithstanding the very painful adjustments already made, part of that is the negative feedback loop from the very high rates of unemployment. So. I mean, everything is connected to everything else in this. Um, I think the issues that I've been watching in, in uh, Spain suggest to me that until we get away from these brutally high levels of unemployment, approaching 26% on average, approaching more than 50% for people aged under 25, that, and I don't mean this in any uh, dismissive way, but that the elegance of labour market law is trumped and trampled under the severe weight of the economic reality. And um, I think until we get back onto some kind of uh, functioning macroeconomy, uh, that I think your question, which is a perfectly valid legal one, risks to take second place in the queue, displaced not because it's not important, but displaced by the more urgent. And I mean it in, in, in that sense. I don't know the specifics, as I said, on the, the labour market law. Another issue in Spain, I think, that external analysts look at a lot, is to what extent is the emerging uh, debate in uh, Spanish regions to move potentially from autonomy to independence, partly driven by it's our money in Madrid and we want it back to cover our regional deficit, to what extent uh, will that itself uh, uh, create a dynamic difficulty? The last thing about Spanish banks, forgive me, but I follow the macro end and, and not the micro end of it. Um, the Spanish banks so far have gone through a recapitalisation and so far that has held. Uh, whether it will continue to hold or not, one doesn't know. Because a lot of times with banks, until you fully crystallise the debt, you don't really know what's hidden. Uh, what I do observe about Spain is that its bank rescue cost is about half the cost of Ireland for an economy that's eight times the size of Ireland and that, like Ireland, went through a property asset bubble. So I find the basic numbers don't add up for me, and I think there's still some stuff in there that, that will express itself. But I think all of these things weigh to the massive unemployment, which, as I said, to do with the urgency of their scale, risk to displace uh, some of the issues that you're raising. That's my feeling, but I'm, I'm, my apologies. And the labour market law is not to avoid your question, it's just a straight up don't know what's the quality of transformation uh, or implementation. Yes, please. Yeah, one last question, maybe from you. Okay. Um, given how long it took the European Union uh, to, get where, to get where it is or get where, or where it was, the series of progressions that you alluded to over, over many, many decades, what's your expectation for uh, the timing not specific timing, but generally, um, in your opinion, how long do you think it will take to make many of the adjustments you're, that need to happen, and which of those areas that you alluded to, fiscal, political, mm. monetary, 
uh, will, do you think will prove to be the most difficult obstacle so far? Okay. Um, my apologies to, to, to other people who want to get some questions in. Um, time scale, the only one I know, with, not with certainty, but reasonable plausibility, is the banking union, because they've agreed to a, a target time scale, and that should be operational by Q1 of 2014, and should be legislatively in place by the end of Q2 of 2013. So that's in that zone. Um, the... Sorry, quarter one and quarter two, just in case I'm, I'm talking some, some economic babble here. Um, the other ones, I think the politics are going to be very difficult. Uh, I think the time scale, uh, I, whether this is going to happen, I don't know. I think the time scale is between two and five years. Uh, so why am I starting with two years? The German election finishes in September, there will be a new government in place, it will do whatever it's going to start doing early in its term. But in 2014, the current European administration uh, reaches the end of life. The European Parliament has to be renewed in elections in summer of 2014. And in the autumn of 2014, in the fall of that year, the, the uh, European Commission has to be renewed. So Europe is going to take a, a big chunk of time out in effect, to renew itself. So you can take the legislative stuff pretty well off the table after the end of the first quarter of 2014 until the, the, probably the first quarter, frankly, of 2015 because you have a European Parliament election, a reconstitution of the Parliament itself, then a hearing of a nominee for the Commission presidency, then a nomination of a programme, and then a nomination of commissioners, then auditions for commissioners, on the outings the last two times round, some guys got sent home, and so you have to have a new nomination and a new audition, so that takes time. So they're probably all in place before Christmas of uh, 2014. Under the Lisbon Treaty, Mr. Van Rompuy has to disappear off the scene. You can get two terms. His two terms are up in 2014, so they need you know, someone to replace uh, him. And so that's a lot of change. It's going to use up the political capital, and then they all settle down to do their work. So I figure whatever is in the bag by the first quarter of 2014 uh, is, is good to go. And I, the rest, I think, you kind of lose a year between different elections. And after that, then, what are the issues? Uh, not the issues, but what are the, the potential constraints? I would say, broadly speaking, my instinct is that the German political elite will not be a soft touch to do with the financial side, but will not be impossibly difficult to deal with. I think they will put in conditionality and some degree of Europeanisation or federalisation uh, of policy making, to which they will submit themselves no less than others, which is not to be overlooked. They are not asking for rules for the other guys that they won't ask for themselves. And the rules that they're applying on the budget under this fiscal compact treaty, which we ratified last year, uh, are rules that apply with no less force to Germany than they do to Spain except Germany isn't in the same circumstance. The other element in this, I think, um, if I take France, so in the Franco-German space, France is rhetorically very European, but in practice quite sovereignty sensitive. And so I think some of the trade-offs that Germany would make in the kind of federal journey would find more pushback in the French part of the journey. And on the budget side, uh, I think uh, money will be forthcoming because the cost of failure is higher than the cost of sustaining. But I think it will be with uh, quite a lot of conditionality. And I think this is not mission impossible. I think the new contract for Europe, I won't be doing this because I'm out of that space, but if I was looking to be the next Commission President and bringing a programme to the European Parliament, I would emphasise all of these elements in a very strong way the headroom that Europe needs to develop to assist those going through the worst crisis and to put in conditionality that means it's, nothing for, it's not something for nothing, but equally that it is something real that offers hope. I think the big issue for Europe, and I'll perhaps finish on this, and the Beppe Grillo example is, is one of them, is if you want standard systems 
to work in a broadly standard way in the face of crisis. You have to be able to deliver, and I mean deliver, not just rhetorically, a message of hope. And the more that people associate a project with angst and not hope, the more they look at pessimism and not optimism, the more you create the political preconditions for the thing to be destroyed from within. And so that is really the heart, the heart, the heart of it and the hard core of it is to discover the tools that permit us to escape from something which we can leave. And the very final number, numbers do speak. If I took the combined budget deficits of the Eurozone 17, they are half of the deficits of the United States of America or Japan. And if I looked at the primary deficit, i.e. taking out interest payments, Europe is close to a zero primary deficit in the Eurozone, the United States 6% of GDP. So the how come is not in fact the deficits, it's the toolkit. The deficit in Europe is already, with all of its difficulties, better managed than some other comparators one could pick. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of data on that stuff, so it's not propaganda, it's just that the numbers add up that way. But the problem has been Mr. Van Rompuy's empty toolkit, which has had a lot of tools put in, but we're not fully finished that task. So for me, again, a great pleasure to have this opportunity to meet you. I'm sorry I missed uh, some of the uh, questions. I'm around college, and I hope I meet some of you again at different things. I'm around uh, tonight and tomorrow. I look forward to see some of you then, and thank you very much indeed for your attendance.